Thank you. And sorry if my voice goes a little bit because I've been with fever for the last two days, so I'm a bit hazy still. Um, so the um, as Sadie said, I I am the fieldwork trainer in Mola. I've been for two and a half years now, and when I started, I the the session that I'm going to do now is a little bit more theoretical than what we have been thinking because I realized that I needed to understand a little bit more about training people and how people learn so I could actually understand what I needed to give people uh, in order for them to learn better, uh, especially because I've been working with uh, people that were still in university or uh, non-archaeologists that just wants to start on, on, on field work. So in the session, I, I want to talk about a little bit why is there such a big gap between theory and practice. And um, if, if we can see if training, um, training can bridge the gap between theory and practice. So for this, we have to see how adult trainers uh, adult trainees uh, learn, and how does this all relate to the theory <coughs> of, you know, processualism and post processualism, and how can um, all the th having theory on the practice can um, help to um, better the learning process? And at the end, I've been realizing that this relationship is actually bringing a new power lay uh, in the commercial side. So it is all very linked. Um, so basically, um, one, when we talk about theory and practice, we think about two very different things. And there are obviously these connections from theory modules to field schools. Uh, university modules to workforce and the research takes to commercial archaeology, they're all not linked at all and nobody thinks that they have any relationship to each other. So, in, um, based on um, Crutcher um, study, we see that the separation between theory and practice is very obvious since, since fifth schools. Um, in, in the best of times, the people that see field schools in the most positive light, um, they understand the value of field work and they can, they, they can make that relationship between uh, their modules that they see in uni and how the field work helped them to understand that a little bit better. But um, m to be honest, most people think that doing field work is only helpful if you want to be a practical archaeologist. So they don't see that connection between their degree and um, practical archaeology or, or field schools. So, however, uh, in the same study we can see that there's a little bit more agreement on how people see that field school do the, does help them with other type of skills. So we have social skills, we have, um, they realize that the different environments does help with people that have different um, learning styles. Um, and um, it does help with some kind of written research and numeracy skills. And also those that can see it in the best uh, light can see that it does help with their critical thinking, independent thought and problem solving. So, we do agree and we can see that field work does provide a very good, um, does have very good potential to be an excellent tool for learning. Um, and this is, mo most people would agree with this because it is um, obvious that it gives you first-hand experience, so it gives you a tangible learning experience um, that, you know, it, it's, it's valuable for visual learners and for experimental learners. But, um, and also, uh, it, it does help understanding the link between how 
how the evidence turns into uh, knowledge creation. So how does the methods and the process of becoming archaeological knowledge and also it helps developing uh, critical thinking, analytical and interpretative skills. But um, so basically the practical value is widely accepted, but still this connection with theory is, is, is still not seen. It's all in the very practical way of seeing things. So it, when, when I've been doing my, my own thinking, I, I try to think, well, uh, can training help bridge the gap between theory and practice, or even can bringing together theory and practice can help with the training process, which is what I've been mostly interested in. And um, so for this, I realized that I needed to understand how my trainees learn, and for these, I started um, studying uh, andragogy. <coughs> and if somebody knows how to say it, how to pronounce that word, please do <laughs> let me know because most people don't know. So andragogy is basically uh, the process, the, the 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 theory of how adults learn. Um, which is very different to how children learn because children do not have experiences prior to what they're doing, um, but um, adults do have experiences. They have, um, they have um, different uh, baggage that children don't have. So the way that adults learn and the, the way that we need to teach them on site it's completely different to what we think. So um, um, let's stop for a minute on what andragogy entails. And first off, we need to have involved adults in the learning process. So basically, when we're teaching adults, they need to be active learners. Um, we have to give them first an experience that allows them to have some certain so uh, degree of autonomy to be able to make sense of the things that they are actually doing. Um, the second principle is that adults learners have experiences that they're going to use um, in, um, in their learning process. They're going to access to them. So if there might be a contradiction between what you're telling them and what they have in their experience, this can be very difficult to um, overcome, which is why we need to find the ways for them to be able to contrast their previous experience with what they're learning. The third one is the relevance and impact to their learners' lives. So, um, adult learners, they need to understand the uses and the benefits of what they're doing, um, of the new information that they are acquiring, why are they acquiring it, uh, in order to maintain their motivation. And the last one is problem centered. Learn, uh, adult learners need to be, uh, to understand the purpose of what they're learning and how this is going to help them to solve problems in the long run. So, as you can imagine, with these principles, um, training needs to, training in the fieldwork needs to move away from being a teacher to being a coach, a little bit more like a coach, that um, you basically facilitate the process um, so they are autonomy, they have some autonomy in their thinking, they feel like they're respected, and we can understand the context where they come from, so, um, so the education can be uh, long-lasting and effective. So we also need to create some linking with their previous experience um, to give them opportunity to self-reflect on what they're learning, 
And uh, this way, they're going to feel engaged and they're going to take responsibility for their outcomes. They need to feel that they have some control and some um, um, responsibility on what they're doing. So, um, as you can imagine, I started thinking, and um, we can see that this idea of andragogy is based on the paradigm of constructivism in which humans construct their own knowledge and their, the meaning of what they're experiencing. So um, this is based on the fact that people are self-aware of what they're learning and that we cannot teach uh, um, universal truth. And um, as we're in time, you will be aware that this connects very well to the idea that we have in archaeology about moving away from the idea of positivism and bringing a more, I am um, bringing an idea of the importance of understanding that we are, are there, that archaeology is full of um, subjectivism and that interpretations are um, very much alive in what we do all the time. So, Um, archaeology then and, 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 and learning becomes a relative exercise between the evidence and, and, and the person, the archaeologist. So there's no universal truth, but in order to avoid this hermeneutic relativism in which everything is uh, it's valid, we do need to keep a balance between the evidence and our interpretations. And this is, as a trainer, what I'm thinking about. This is my role. My role is to be a mediator between this person, this um, trainee or the other learner, uh, between them and the evidence so they can have an empowered relationship to interpret this evidence. Um, so, in the process of becoming a mediator between the evidence and the interpreted, um, it's even more relevant to think about how the principles of andragogy. So, how do we facilitate this process of um, um, interpreting the archaeology um, in a way that um, based on the fourth and the four um, andragogy uh, principles, we make it long lasting and um, a positive experience for them. So we need to train people in to be self-aware of how are they are interpreting the, um, the evidence and why they are doing this. How does their um, own experiences and their own bias are mixed into what they're doing. So in this sense, um, they need to achieve self-awareness. We need to teach them to um, understand the different questions that they need to pose the evidence um, we, we need to uh, help them to uh, contrast and judge the validity of their interpretations and to challenge their own attitudes and subjectivities. Um, so the, the learner or the trainees, they should learn how to ask these questions to the evidence and uh, judge for themselves how the different interpretations are and how much validity they can have. And this is a very empowering um, um, process in which they should be the ones making the decisions because the idea is that we give them the tools and the set of skills in order to um, make the decisions for themselves. So, um, 
in reality, how can we on site? Because for me, as as a trainer, I'm like, okay, this theory is all good, but how how do I do this on site? So, um, how can we promote this self awareness on the trainees so they understand what what they're doing and why they're doing it? Um, so the first thing I think it's um, connecting the skills to the interpretative level. So they need to understand that there are things of the evidence that don't um, have room for that many interpretations. I mean, if we're talking about technology or subsistence, there's not that many things. But if we go into society or religion, then the interpretative can be much bigger. So um, we need to learn to balance the skills with the theoretical level. And we, we need to move from just telling them, oh, you know, your feature is undercut. And we need to give them a little bit more and say, um, you need to maybe try to overcut because that way you're going to be able to see the whole shape of your ditch in order to make it uh, understand the difference between a different uh, defense or a boundary ditch. And this is, this is very um, theoretical, but we're still keeping it on the um, uh, um, technology level. The other strategy is to promote self-discovery. In this sense, it's not just doing, but it's facilitating how um, they truly understand what they're doing, um, why are they doing, and if, if we promote them to understand the bigger picture then, and the reasoning behind it, we will be able for them to make the connections of why they're doing what they're doing. So again, moving on from just telling them to fill in a matrix, we try to make them to exercise, to complete a matrix out of nothing that they have done before. And then that way they will be connecting all the dots on why things should be the way um, we want them to be in a specific way for a reason. And the last strategy to promote this self-awareness is democratizing the, the knowledge. And we already talked a little bit about this. Um, we need to move away from the idea that supervisors <coughs> are the ones, or the ones that write the reports, are the ones that have a, an ultimate say. And there needs to be a, um, a degree of communication at all time, uh, and not only between the evidence and the interpretation, but um, focusing on the process. We always need to be communicating to them about um, what's the process, What's the rationale for the process? What are the strategies and the choices that um, we have made in planning that we are making in the post-excavation? So they understand, they are allowed to question the process and see everything in a more autonomy way that allow, allows them to actively learn everything, uh, the whole process. Um, how, how, what they do, um, plays a role in their results uh, or um, and, and this would make them feel much appreciated so rather than telling them okay just record this wall in a little bit more detail if we tell them okay we need you to explain better how this wall was constructed because we want to see if this wall has a relationship with another wall that we had on another side if, if you don't give us the details, we're not going to know if they're the same world, for example. This gives them a much broader idea and the bigger picture. So some final thoughts are um, we can see how theory does have a bigger role in, um, in the coaching um, uh, process. If I don't give them a little bit of the theory, and it, it doesn't mean like all this processual or post-processual, but we give them the bigger picture, this is the only way that um, we're going to be able to give the meaning to what we do 
encourage, encourage them to be autonomous, re um, reveal their own subjectivities, they're going to be able to see them, and, and it does give them access to the whole archaeological process. <coughs> so the questions are, should we rethink the way that we think we do archaeology on site? Is the, do we need to give more powers to the diggers? Uh, do they have more power than we actually think we do? they do? Um, and how can we actually bring this power to them? It's not just about them uh, writing context, um, context sheets, but how do they, we, we, re, we make them realize that we actually think about it when we write reports? Um, so, thank you.